Good day, my name is Tian Hulnais, and on this video, I would like to discuss the extremely important subject of the dangers of the ecumenical movement. Is it something that we Christians should take note about, or let it just pass by us and participate therein? We will see today that it is not just something that we can let pass by us. We need to take note of what is happening in the ecumenical movement and what the Word of God teaches us. And my brother and sister, this video I will be recording in a new way. I'm doing it via the Zoom app. So please bear with me if you may note one or two little glitches in this recording. But as always, it is always about our Lord Jesus Christ first. So let us pray together first. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. We know the Bible says we two or three are gathered in my name. I am in their midst. So, Lord, we know you're here. We're busy with it, with this recording. But you will also be there where people will be watching this video, wherever they may be. And we pray, as always, that your Holy Spirit will take me out of the way, Lord, that I will not be the one speaking, but that your Holy Spirit will speak in and through me, and that all our hearts would be willing to receive the truth of the Word of God. And thank you, Father, that you still give us the authority to say to Satan, we bind your works now. You will not steal this message from the ears of the children of God, and you will live in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, now we pray that you will cover us with your blood wherever we may be. We pray that you will set up your angels all around us, and that you yourself will be a wall of fire round about us according to Zechariah 2 verse 5, so that every place will be a safe place while we're busy. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Please take us by the hand and lead us now by your Holy Spirit. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in this video, we will be discussing the following five points. Namely, number one, what is ecumenism? Number two, all religions and faiths to unite. Number three, Chrislam. Number four, all roads lead to Rome. And number five, but the Bible says... And all who know me know I always start with this verse in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 13 that says, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And today we will see what the Bible teaches us regarding what is happening in the ecumenical movement throughout the world. Because in Matthew 22 verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of of God. And I always say to people, can you see what Jesus is saying there? That we err, meaning we are deceived. We are pulled away after wrong doctrines. Why? Because we do not know our scriptures. And why don't we know our scriptures? Because in so many instances, we do not know the author of the scriptures. We are not in a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And only when we get to meet him personally, get baptized with his Holy Spirit, and when his Holy Spirit starts to break open his scriptures to us, we get to know the power of God in our personal lives, the power of God in our marriages, the power of God in our relationships with our children, the power of God in our normal day-to-day -day lives. Because that is what God plans for us in his fullness and in his grace and mercy. But we need to know him. And we need to know his scriptures to get to know the power of God. In order for any born-again, Bible-believing Christian to truly understand the seriousness of what I will be discussing on this video, you also need to understand what the biblical problems are with the Roman Catholic Church as a whole and as a religious system. Therefore, Please also ensure that you watch my YouTube video on Roman Catholicism versus the Bible at the link in yellow below, or just type in my name and that title on YouTube, and you will also find the video. Or you can contact me via my email at the back of this video, and I will send it to you. My brother and sister, it is really, really important. This video that I'm sharing with you is extremely important, and it is very serious. You really need to know why I'm doing this, referring to what the Roman Catholic Church system is doing across the world, so that you can be warned according to the Word of God. Because remember one thing, you will not stand before the throne of your church one day. You will not stand before the throne of your reverend or your pastor or your priest. You will be standing before the throne of God one day, and you will be there alone. 
And God is going to ask you, my child, what did you do with this book? Did you study it for yourself or did you just believe what people taught you? And then we are going to need to answer God, each and every one of us, for ourselves. So please don't take any chances. Ensure that you get to know the author of the scriptures in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you, are, if you have not yet done that in your life, at the back of this video will be a prayer that you can pray to receive the Lord Jesus in your life as well, so that you can enter into a personal relationship with him and also ask his Holy Spirit to break open his scriptures to you so that you can live according to the word of God. Now at number one, let us discuss the question, what is ecumenism? And people, please, I always say, don't just believe me. Go and do your own research. There are loads and loads and loads of articles uh, written about this whole movement rushing across the world, pulling in many Christians into this as well. So please go and do your own research as well and ask for the leading of the Holy Spirit, and he will lead you to the right ones. Now, according to Britannica.com, ecumenism is the movement or tendency toward worldwide Christian unity or cooperation. The term of recent origin emphasizes what is viewed as the universality of the Christian faith and unity among churches. The ecumenical movement seeks to recover the apostolic sense of the early church for unity in diversity, and it confronts the frustrations, difficulties, and ironies of the modern pluralistic world. It is a lively reassessment of the historical sources and destiny of what followers perceive to be the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church of Jesus Christ. The word ecumenism is derived from the Greek words. You can see the one there meaning the inhabited world and the other one meaning house and can be traced from the commands, promises, and prayers of Jesus, they say. After the International Missionary Conference held at Edinburgh in 1910, Protestants began to use the term ecumenism to describe the gathering of missionary, evangelistic service, and unit of forces. So initially, the idea behind ecumenism was in line with what the Word of God teaches. But during and after the Second Vatican Council of the Roman Catholic Church between 1962-1965, Roman Catholics used ecumenism to refer to the renewal of the whole life of the church undertaken to make it more responsive to separate the churches and to the needs of the world. So from that time onwards, the Roman Catholic Church took over this whole idea behind ecumenism. And the idea is, my brother and sister, as you will see as we go along, to pull any other churches out there into the arms of the Roman Catholic Church. The initial aim of the ecumenical movement headed by the Roman Catholic Church was to unite all so-called Christian groups under one universal body, the World Council of Churches, which was formed in 1941. So who is behind the World Council of Churches? The Roman Catholic Church. The ultimate aim of this body is to form a one-world religion headed by the Pope of Rome. What they have succeeded in doing so far is to bring most denominations back to Rome. Many Protestants, Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, and even Evangelicals are now joining the ecumenical movement, and they all think it's the right thing to do, and it sounds so right, but meantime, they are slowly and surely being pulled back under Roman Catholicism. You all know the story of the little frog swimming in the water and the water is getting warmer and warmer and warmer and eventually it just dies because it does not realize the water is getting warmer. So it does not jump out of the water. The same thing is happening here over ages. Since the Second Vatican Council held in 1963, the ecumenical dialogue has extended to non-Christian groups such as Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, witch doctors, etc. The aim now is to draw 
all religions into a global one world religion under the leadership of the Pope, as we will see. But we read in Matthew 24, verse 3 and 4, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. See what Jesus says? It is interesting to note there, my brother and sister. What does Jesus say? He says, take heed that no man deceive you. So what is the first sign? When the disciples asked him, what will be the signs of your times and your before you return for the second time? He said, take heed that no man deceive you. So the first sign of our times is deception. And my brother and sister, I tell you today, the ecumenical movement is proof of this deception. And many people are being deceived through what the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church is busy doing all over the world. So beware that no man deceive you. Why? Because there is also a warning that there may be a curse upon your life. Because in Jeremiah 17, verse 5, thus saith the Lord. And I always say to people, remember, if you read the word Lord like that in capital letters in the King James Version of the Bible that I use, L-O-R-D, in the Hebrew, it is written yod Hey vav Hey, because our Father's name in Hebrew is Yahweh. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith Yahweh, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. My brother and sister, please do not put your trust in any man. That's why I say, also, don't just believe me. Please go and do your own research regarding these things. Because if you just put your trust in your pastor, in your priest, in your pope, in your reverend, in your whoever, you are opening the door for a curse upon your life because you're trusting in that man and not in God. So you need to get to a place of knowing your scriptures, knowing the author of the scriptures and asking him to lead you by his Holy Spirit. But let us now see what is Pope Francis's view of what happened on the day of Pentecost. This is the homily of Pope Francis that he gave at St. Peter's Square on Saturday, the 30th of September, 2023. That's only a few months ago. At the inauguration of 21 new Roman Catholic Cardinals, when we'll get back to this as well. What did he say on that day? What is his view of what happened at the day of Pentecost? It is a matter of applying to ourselves. I will put myself first, the Pope says. The experience of those Jews who by a gift of God found themselves protagonists of the event of Pentecost, that is of the baptism by the Holy Spirit. Now look at this. That gave birth to the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. To think back with gratitude on the gift of having been evangelized and having been drawn from various peoples who, each in their own time, received the kerygma, the proclamation of the mystery of salvation, and in welcoming it, were baptized in the Holy Spirit and became part of the church. But look at what he says now. Mother Church, who speaks all languages, is one and is Catholic. So what is the Pope's view of what happened on the day of Pentecost? He believed that day the Roman Catholic Church came to be. But it's not true, my brother and sister. The Roman Catholic Church only came into being a few hundred years later. So that is not the truth. But that is the way they try to let people think. But we're all part of this one holy Catholic Church, trying to say to people, but the word Catholic just means the universal church. In their eyes, my brother and sister, it means the Roman Catholic Church, no other. And that is why at no point in time have they publicly renounced all the things they have done in the past over the ages in torturing Protestants, killing Protestants, and all these kinds of things. They have not done that publicly, but what are they doing? They're starting to pull back Protestants back into their arms so that they can control them in a totally different way, and the people don't see this. True Bible-believing evangelical Christians 
who oppose this false unity and who refuse to compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ to make it more acceptable and non-offensive to all faiths, because that's what they want to do with this ecumenical movement, to make the gospel of Jesus Christ more acceptable to other faiths and non-offensive to all faiths. And people like you and I who will stand up for the truth and who refuse uh, to compromise, we will be called fundamentalist cults or sects. These believers will undoubtedly be earmarked for persecution in the future, just as it was during the Dark Ages when the Bible was on the list of forbidden literature, because only the priests and the cardinals and the bishops and the Pope could read the Bible for their people in those Dark Ages. There is no way that any true Bible-believing Christians can participate in any such interfaith or ecumenical meetings not with any members of the apostate Roman Catholic Church, nor with any members of any other faith. According to the Marymount University, interfaith is seen as, look at this definition now, interfaith in its most basic sense is when people or groups from different religious or spiritual worldviews and traditions come together. Did you know interfaith cooperation also can include atheists and agnostics and people of no faith? Interfaith cooperation is the conscious bringing together. So it's a planned thing. It is the conscious bringing together of people from diverse religious, spiritual, and ethical beliefs. So it's all about bringing them all together and saying, but we all worship the same God. Yes, we all are children of the same God. Yes, we may differ in certain small little things, but remember, we are all part of the same God. No, it's not true, my brother and sister. These are the lies that people are being pulled into through these interfaith and ecumenical meetings. Because the God of the Bible is clear that he does not give his glory to any other. In Isaiah 42 verse 8, we read, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 48 verse 11. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory to another. Can you see what God says there? That he will not give his glory to any other. God does not share his glory with the kingdom of darkness, my brother and sister. So I really want you to take note of these two verses here, that God is very clear on that he is God alone. He does not share his glory with any other. No born-again Bible-believing Christian can come together with or stand on a stage or participate in a meeting with people of other faiths, including the Roman Catholic Church to pray for any common goal, because that's what they usually say. Oh, but we're doing this for a common goal, for the common good of our town or our city or our community. For example, to fight against poverty in your community or to ask for rain or to pray for the safety of the local community or for so-called city transformation or for the spiritual needs of the city. Because that means those true Bible-believing Christians in that meeting will then thereby agree in prayer to other gods, for example, Allah, Mother Mary, Buddha, etc. In that way, they will be giving the glory that belongs to our God alone, to Yahweh alone. They will be giving that glory to other gods. And the above two verses are clear that he does not give his glory to any other. Yet, that is what many proponents of the so-called New Apostolic Reformation do. And my brother and sister, I also have an ebook on the New Apostolic Reformation. What is that? That I can send to you if you would like to read that, or you can find it on ebooks under my name. Yet, that is what many proponents of the New Apostolic Reformation do all over the world, including here in South Africa using all the right arguments to justify what they are doing, like using the buzzword unity at all costs. But yes, we must be in unity with all Christians and other Christians. 
and thereby or immediately implying that the Roman Catholics are Christians according to the word of God, which they are not, my brother and sister. If you go and watch my video on Roman Catholicism versus the Bible, you will see they do not serve the same God that you and I do according to the word of God. However, the ecumenical and interfaith meetings between Christians and people of other faiths, including the Roman Catholic Church, are most definitely not the spiritual unity that the Bible talks about that must exist between believers of the true God of the Bible. My brother and sister, we really need to take serious note of what is happening with these interfaith and ecumenical meetings. It sounds so right. It sounds as, as if we're doing things together for the common good, but it's not about the common good. It's about the salvation of souls according to the word of God. Are we getting those people saved? Are we praying for the salvation of the souls of those other people in our community? Or do we just go with them and part participate in certain things for the common good with them? And then we think we've done what we're supposed to do according to the word. No, we must beware. We are being pulled into that hot water and the water is becoming warmer and warmer and warmer. And we're just swimming around it like that little froggy, eventually dying in that water coming to a boil. No, we must be wake up and we must wake up and we must get out of that water. Now, number two, let us look at the fact that all religions and faiths are to unite. Remember that earlier quote, since the Second Vatican Council held in 1963, the ecumenical dialogue has extended to non-Christian groups such as Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, witch doctors, etc. The aim now is to draw all religions into a global one world religion under the leadership of the Pope. And people say, no, it can't be. There's no way that the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church will allow that. Now, let us look at some pictures here. And this is on available on internet, wherever you may search. That's why I say, please, my brother and sister, even if you may be a Roman Catholic watching this video of mine, and before you get very angry, ask the true Holy Spirit of God to reveal these things to you and go and do your own research. And there we see the Pope being blessed by an Aborigine witch doctor. And these are pictures of different Popes that the Roman Catholic Church has had over the past number of years. The top right-hand corner, the Pope and a voodoo witch doctor. Bottom left, the Pope and the Buddhist Dalai Lama. Bottom right, the Pope and the Hindu religious leader. Then the Pope and Muslim religious leaders. Top right-hand corner, more idolatry in action. Pope John Paul II kisses the Quran. So he is known to be the vicar of Christ, yet he kisses the Quran. Christ would have never kissed any other faith's book, holy book, my brother and sister. Bottom left, the Pope with Muslim leaders on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Bottom right, the Pope, and this is now the Pope that we have today, and Jewish religious leaders. Top left, Pope and leader of the Korean native religion. Top right, the Pope and leaders of different world religions. Bottom left, Pope and UK Muslim leaders. Bottom right, Pope and Thai religious leaders. And see what's behind them on the wall there. Building Bridges for Peace and Understanding. This was a meeting in November 2019. But my brother and sister, in the Bible we read that in Matthew 28 verse 19 to 20, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach. Now you see the Greek word there for teach. It also means go and disciple all nations. That means go and make disciples of Jesus Christ of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I, this is Jesus speaking, have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So Jesus did not say, go and build bridges for peace and understanding with unbelievers. He said, go teach them what I commanded you. He said, go make disciples of all those nations. Yet the Pope 
is trying to build bridges for peace and understanding. So he is not obedient to the instruction of Jesus Christ just before he ascended to heaven. Top left, Pope and head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Top right, Pope and Hindu religious leader and also bottom right, the same man. Bottom left, Pope and Buddhist religious leaders. And in Ephesians 5 verse 11 and 12, we also read, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. The word also means expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So we should have no fellowship with other faiths and religions and beliefs. Why? Because we have an instruction to go and teach them, to make disciples of them. And immediately that causes confrontation, my brother and sister. And that is why these people would rather have fellowship with other religions rather than trying to make disciples of them because then, then they don't have confrontation anymore. So they don't want to be confronted by these other people swearing at them or chasing them away or even killing them because they are trying to convert them to Christianity. So no, that's not what they're doing. They're having fellowship instead of being obedient to the word that says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, rather expose these things, my brother and sister. Thus, if you associate yourself, that means have fellowship with the Roman Catholic Church and what they do, you are thereby actually also associating with all the other groups they associate with. And how can you do that if you call yourself a born-again, Bible-believing Christian follower of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? And we see the warning that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of the devils. My brother and sister, you cannot stand with one foot in the world and one foot with God and think it's acceptable to God. Remember, it's not about how your pastor views this or how your reverend may see this or how your family may see this. It is about how God sees this. God is a jealous God, my brother and sister, and he does not share us with the kingdom of darkness. Now, let us look at some other pictures now of the Pope and James Robeson and the Pope and Kenneth Copeland. At the bottom left-hand corner, we have a picture there of Pope John Paul II meeting Benny Hinn, and we read what is written there. Pope John Paul II, who led the Catholic Church for 26 years, met with Pastor Benny Hinn twice to address shared concerns about spiritual needs around the globe. Jesus did not say, discuss the spiritual needs of the world with unbelievers. Here we have a picture taken in June of 2014 of John and Carol Arnott, Brian Stiller, Kenneth Copeland, Thomas Schirmacher, Jeff Tunnicliffe, James Robeson, Betty Robeson, and Tony Palmer meeting with the Pope. Now, who are these people having this ecumenical meeting with the Pope and praying with the Pope and sharing these things with the Pope? John and Carol Arnott are the founders of the Catch the Fire, look at this now, Network of Churches. This is where the Toronto Blessing started in 1994. Brian C. Stiller is Global Ambassador of the World Evangelical Alliance, the Global Association, which represents some 600 million evangelical Protestants. Evangelical Protestants, my brother and sister, you and I who call ourselves born-again Bible-believing Christians are also evangelical Protestants. So these people say they are representing 600 million evangelical Protestants having an ecumenical meeting with the Pope. Kenneth Copeland, well-known prosperity gospel preacher in the New Apostolic Reformation and televangelist. Thomas Schirmacher is a German Christian moral philosopher and a specialist in the sociology of religion and religious freedom. He serves the World Evangelical Alliance as Secretary General. He is also an Anglican realignment bishop. Now, the realignment bishop is bishops who believe that there's nothing wrong to have gay 
preachers or gay priests or gay bishops and cardinals in the church. That is what a realignment bishop means. Jeff Tunnicliffe is a global strategist, advisor, peace activist, and author. He was the secretary general for that same World Evangelical Alliance that we see at the top from 2005 to 2014. James Robeson is an American televangelist and the founder and president of the Christian relief organization Life Outreach International. Tony Palmer served as a bishop within the communion of evangelical episcopal churches and held informal ecumenical dialogue with the Catholic Church through Pope Francis until his death in July 2014. These people are all having and were all having, and I tell you, are still having ecumenical meetings with the Roman Catholic Church and with the Pope. Here we see Billy Graham, the Pope and Billy Graham. Their first meeting was on 12th January 1981, and then they had a second meeting in uh, January of 1990. Evangelist Billy Graham met with Pope John Paul II and Vatican officials a week ago for a series of discussions on Eastern Europe, and look at this now, and relations between Catholics and evangelicals around the world, it was learned this week. My brother and sister, if you know that the Roman Catholic Church do not believe in the same God that you and I do. They are not born again, Bible-believing Christians. Their souls need salvation. You cannot discuss relations between Catholics and evan evangelicals. You need to pray and you need to share the gospel with the Roman Catholic so that they can also be saved and be with the Lord Jesus in all eternity. But in South Africa, even our main denominations are also becoming part of this whole ecumenical movement. At the left-hand side, we see from the Facebook page of the Apostolic Faith Mission of South Africa, at the bottom here, encircled in red, it says, one of the AFM's drivers is ecumenism, meaning the promotion of unity and cooperation among Christians and churches. In layman's terms, it means that there is a genuine endeavor to take hands with other Christians wherever and whenever possible. So again, it means they also see the Roman Catholic Church as Christians. How do we know that? Because on the right-hand side there, we see that the deputy president of the AFM of South Africa visited the Vatican City in September 2023, when the Pope, remember I quoted his homily that he gave on the 30th of September 2023, when 21 Roman Catholic cardinals were appointed, that's what he gave at the Vatican City. And the picture at the top there on the left-hand side is the deputy president of the AFM of South Africa. On the right-hand side, we have the Cardinal of Cape Town of the Roman Catholic Church, who was then initiated or inducted on that day at the Vatican City. And the AFM attended that. So part of their ecumenical drive is to take hands with Christians wherever and whenever. This proves that they believe that the Roman Catholics are Christians. And again, if people say, but this is just a, a Facebook hoax or whatever the case may be, well, on the next page, we see the same picture. Now, this is from the Facebook page of the deputy president of South Africa from his own church, where some of his own people congratulate him on his attending at the Cardinal's institution and saying, God bless you. And when a friend of mine sent out a podcast warning the people about this kind of thing with the churches taking hands with the Roman Catholic Church and all that, he was blown out of the water. But an interesting thing happened. One of the senior AFM church leaders in South Africa then sent a WhatsApp to a person who asked him regarding this. And I've got this WhatsApp on my phone. And in this, and I've translated this from Afrikaans into English, this senior AFM church leader said the following. The idea of a one world religion is really a conspiracy theory. Any right-minded person should know that the chances are about zero, that Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus, to name a few religions, will combine their different beliefs, books, and actions in one religion. 
That the AFM may be part of something like that is totally absurd and unfounded, the senior AFM church leader said in this WhatsApp to the person that asked him about it. Now again, if we look at the fact that they are already attending ecumenical meetings in the Vatican City, that means they are actually already part of this, my brother and sister. But let us see if his view regarding the conspiracy theory of a one-world religion is true according to the word of God. Revelation 17 speaks of a great prostitute or great harlot that is generally understood as a metaphor for a false religion that will exist during the tribulation period. Many have debated the identity of this religion with some arguing the Roman Catholic Church Islam or another large religious movement will be the end times one world religion. However, it is more likely that the false religion of the last days will consist of an inclusive religion that allows for a pluralistic view of God. In other words, all the other faiths and the religions also coming together as we have seen so far. This would include even liberal monotheistic groups that see all religions as one. And as we have seen, the Pope is also already busy doing these meetings, pulling these people close under the Roman Catholic Church, pulling other faiths and beliefs, coming together with, bringing together other faiths and beliefs, and Protestants, and Evangelicals, and Charismatics. is doing the same thing to everybody across the world and are willing to worship the Antichrist in the last days. Because my brother and sister, the Roman Catholic system is the Antichrist system of the last days. Some wonder if this one world religion already exists today. I believe it does through these ecumenical and interfaith meetings. The specific one world religion of the end times cannot be fully developed until the tribulation when the Antichrist rules. That I agree with. But the wheels are turning and rolling and it's already up and running. Because this author also writes, however, the growth in religious pluralism, interfaith dialogue that promotes the idea that all religions are equal and the erroneous teachings that many ways lead to God or to heaven all exist today. These views certainly foreshadow what scripture predicts will be more prevalent in the future when the world unites under one religion under the power of the Antichrist. So my brother and sister, it is most definitely not just a conspiracy theory that all these religions are busy uniting and will reunite eventually finally under the Antichrist, but this movement is pulling everything in that direction. Now look at this. This is a booklet that commemorates the opening of the Nanhua Buddhist temple in Bronkor Sprite in 2005. The person that came to me for counseling showed me this and he sent me these pictures from this booklet. Now in this booklet, there are different letters from different organizations welcoming this new Buddhist temple in Bronco Sprite. And I'm only going to show you three letters. The first one was written by the South African Council of Churches. And all our large denominations in South Africa are part of the South African Council of Churches, who are then also obviously part of the World Council of Churches, who we have now seen is actually run under the auspices of the Roman Catholic Church, now look what the president of the South African Council of Churches wrote to the leader of this Buddhist temple in 2005. The opening of your main temple is an important symbol of presence to us all in South Africa. Such a presence is not only welcomed, but is also experienced as welcoming to all people of faith in this country. This distinguished and distinguishing presence meaning the presence now of this Buddhist temple, will contribute, as your community has been doing, to the building of respect and tolerance, the restoration of human dignity, and the development of unity in our nation. We regard this great day of the opening of the temple as a contribution to the very substance of our common humanity and the future hope of the country and its people. My brother and sister, I can really 
think how Jesus would have stood in the temple of God saying, you know what, that temple that they have over there for uh, Baal, and that temple that they have over there for Ashtaroth, oh, it's acceptable. Welcome those people of Baal. Welcome those people of Ashtaroth. No, he would never have done that. But this is now the president of the South African Council of Churches under whose auspices all the churches in South Africa, the main denominations are all part of. They welcomed this Buddhist temple. Another one, the Diocese of Pretoria, the Church of the Province of South Africa, the Anglican Bishop of Pretoria also saying, I'm very delighted to receive an invitation to participate at the opening and inauguration of your main temple. It is an honor for me and my diocese to be associated with you and your work of faith. You see, associating themselves with Buddhists, Christians, because the Anglicans say they are Christians, they are associating themselves now with the work of faith of the Buddhists. Yet the AFM leader said it is a conspiracy theory, theory to think that Christians will associate themselves with unbelievers, with Buddhists, with Muslims. Yet we see it. We see it happening in South Africa and it's happening all over the world. And another letter here, Rayma Ministries of the well-known pastor Ray McCauley, where he says, among the many changes that have taken place in the new South Africa has been the opening of communication and dialogue among different religious groups, the forming of the National Religious Leaders Forum, of which he is the president, has allowed not only interaction among ourselves, but also the opportunity to hold hands on issues of common concern. You see, they all use this, these words, the common concern, the common good, the common this, the common that. We live in exciting times and the voice of religion needs to be heard in our nation to ensure that peace, tolerance and justice are held high in all of our communities. My Bible says the voice of the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be heard, not just the voice of religion, including Buddhist religion and any other religions. He concludes to say, I take this opportunity to wish you every good thing on the dedication of your main temple. My brother and sister, and then people say, Christians are not being pulled into a one world religion to think that Christians are not being slowly but surely encompassed by the Roman Catholic Church and all the people they associate with. Jesus did not say, warmly welcome idol worshippers when they come into your country, town, or community. Now, here is another one. This was from a newspaper clipping the well-known Afrikaans built newspaper on the 14th of February 2017, where uh, an article was written by a member of the well-known Mosaic Church in Johannesburg, where this person explained about a Sunday morning service where the pastor in that church had a Sangoma, that is a witch doctor, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, and a Christian sitting in a row on the stage. And then they each had a few minutes to explain their different religions to the people in the auditorium. And this author then concludes to say, we are a diverse community, but everybody believes in the same God, even the witch doctors, even the Buddhists, even the Hindus, and etc. So this article is titled, Father's House Has Many Mansions. No, my brother and sister, we do not serve the same God, but in this way, through these little actions, these little interfaith meetings and ecumenical meetings, Christians who do not know the scriptures are being misled, are being deceived, even by their own pastors, their own leaders, letting them think, yes, but we all serve the same God. We don't need to try and convert the Muslims anymore. We don't need to try and convert the Buddhists anymore because, listen to this, we all serve the same God. So Christians are being pulled into this thing, my brother and sister. Can you see, my brother and sister? Christians are being pulled back under the auspices of the Roman Catholic Church. They don't in any way accept responsibility for the things that they've done over the centuries in the past. But now they just receive, they're just pulling everybody under their auspices, all the different religions.
not just the Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, etc., as we will also see as we go along, but also Protestants, Evangelicals, Charismatics, Episcopals, all going back to Rome thinking, yes, we're all Christians. Yes, we can all do, do this together. No, my brother and sister, we cannot. You really need to study your own scriptures. You really need to go and do more research about what I'm talking about on this video so that you can see there is no way that you can participate in any interfaith or ecumenical meetings. At number three, let us now discuss Chrislam. What is Chrislam all about? People, Many people say they've heard the term, but they don't know what it is all about. Now, Chrislam is the unholy union of Christianity and Islam. Chrislam began in the city of Lagos, the biggest city and seaport in Nigeria, with a population of more than 7 million. The author of this unholy union of Islam and Christianity was a man by the name of Tila Tela, who started his religion in the 1980s. Like so many other false religions, Tela claims that an angel of God told him to create this mixed religion that would bring peace between Muslims and Christians. What makes this so bad in the United States are the people who are promoting this movement. Robert Schuller, the founding pastor of the Crystal Cathedral located in Garden Grove, California, was one of the keynote speakers at the conference at Yale Divinity School on July the 30th, 2008. The theme for this conference was to promote understanding and peace between Christianity and Islam. The conference was held in response to a letter signed by 138 Muslim leaders in October of 2007 that called for peace between Muslims and Christians for the sake of world peace. You see, it sounds so right. But Jesus never said that there will be world peace until he comes as the king of peace to reign upon the world. Until then, there will be division. Why? Because people hate us for trying to convert other religions to Christ. But the letter was entitled, A Common Word Between Us and You. There you see it again, a common word. Among the 300 American theologians, ministry leaders, and prominent pastors that signed a letter of response to the Muslim community were Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, Bill Hybels, pastor of Willow Creek Community Church, Robert Schuller, theologian John Stott, Jim Wallace, President of Sojourners, and Leith Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals. Chrislam starts to spread in America. And my brother and sister, throughout all my videos, I always give due credit to the people whose research I've used in that video. And you will always see the links to the different quotations at the bottom of the slides. Rick Warren, the founder and pastor of Saddleback Community Church in Orange County, California, addressed the Convention of the Islamic Society of North America. Warren stated that Muslims and Christians must work together to combat stereotypes, promote peace and freedom, and solve global problems. Christians and Muslims, faith mates, soul mates, and now work mates, Chrislam. Before we shake your hand in responding to your letter, we ask forgiveness of the all-merciful one. And my brother and sister, the all-merciful one for the Muslims is Allah, their God that they worship. So Rick Warren now says, we ask forgiveness of Allah and of the Muslim community around the world. Jesus did not say, promote peace and freedom and solve global problems together with unbelievers. Neither did he say, ask forgiveness of false gods. Rick Warren partnering with mosques to teach that God and Allah are the same. Saddleback Church in Orange County, California, home to super pastor Rick Warren, Obama inauguration, purpose-driven life, etc., has joined forces with Southern California mosques to adopt a three-step plan for ending enmity between evangelical Christians and Muslims. The plan's first step calls for Muslims and Christians to recognize they worship the same God. This is now what Rick Warren and these Muslim leaders try to teach their members. But my brother and sister, I also have a YouTube video on Christianity versus 
Islam that you can go and watch for yourself to see that we do not serve the same God as the Muslims, just as we do not serve the same God as the Roman Catholic Church. Interfaith reconciliation has been proceeding for years between Muslims and more liberal-leaning mainline Protestant denominations. The effort, informally dubbed King's Way, caps years of outreach between Warren and Muslims. Warren has broken Ramadan fast at the Mission Viego Mosque, met Muslim leaders abroad and addressed 8,000 Muslims at a national convention in Washington, D.C. And there is a picture of Rick Warren speaking at the Islamic Society of North America. Even in South Africa, Christians are being deceived through billboards like these saying, Jesus, find him in the Quran. Quran loves him. Quran respects him. Quran orders belief in him. Yeah, the point is, they believe that Jesus was a prophet. They do not believe that he is God or the Son of God. But Christians that do not know this are being deceived. And this is what I discuss on my other video on Christianity versus Islam that you can go and watch for yourself. But because people do not know this, they say, oh, but you see, oh, the Muslims also believe in Jesus, not as God. You and I believe in Jesus as God, as part of the Trinity of God. That is why we do not believe in the same Jesus that they do. And even the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa, which is one of the biggest mainline denominations, have got this problem. And this is now a quote from an article which was written in October 2023, where the Dutch Reformed Church's approval of joint worship with Muslims came under fire. Because this was now a point that was put on the agenda that the Dutch Reformed Church can now also start to pray along with other people that in the past were seen as unbelievers like the Muslims. Because it's part of the ecumenical drive. It is part of the interfaith meetings. They don't drive our great commission anymore. Our great commission is go make disciples of all nations. That's not what these mainline denominations are doing any longer, my brother and sister. Let's look at the Roman Catholicism and Islam. The following passages taken from Nostra Aetate, the Declaration on the Relation of the Church with Non-Christian Religions of the Second Vatican Council, it was promulgated on the 28th of October, 1965, address Islam specifically. Now look at what the Roman Catholic Church said about Islam. Upon the Muslim too, the Church, this is now the Roman Catholic Church, looks with esteem. They adore one God, living and enduring, merciful and all-powerful, maker of heaven and earth, and speaker to men. They strive to submit wholeheartedly even to his inscrutable decrees, just as did Abraham, with whom the Islamic faith is pleased to associate itself. Though they do not acknowledge Jesus as God, they revere him as a prophet. So this is now acceptable to the Roman Catholic Church that the Muslims do revere Jesus as a prophet, even though they don't accept him as God. But so as long as that is true, according to them, we can associate ourselves with the Muslims, they say. They also honor Mary, his virgin mother. At times they call on her too with devotion. And actually they do write about her in the Quran as well. Because I also show in my other videos, my brother and sister, how Islam as a religion was started by the Roman Catholic Church. There is also information available regarding the Roman Catholic influence in the life of Muhammad through people that surrounded him at that time. And it can also be shown uh, with the necessary research. And that is why the Muslims also have certain references in their Quran, which are exactly the same as certain references which are contained in the apocryphal books of the Roman Catholic Church. Consequently, this is now again the Roman Catholic Church speaking about the Muslims. Consequently, they prize the moral life and give worship to God, especially through prayer, almsgiving and fasting. Although in the course of the centuries, many quarrels and hostilities have arisen between Christians and Muslims, this most sacred synod urges all to forget the past and to strive sincerely for mutual understanding. So you see, let's forget the past. And let's just strive for mutual understanding. On behalf of all mankind, let them make common cause of safeguarding and fostering social justice, moral values, peace, and freedom. 
Jesus did not say, strive to have mutual understanding and common cause with unbelievers, my brother and sister. He said, go and convert them. Go make disciples of them. Don't strive to have mutual understanding of your different religions. This author writes, last July, for the first time during a mass, that is the Roman Catholic mass in Italy, a verse of the Quran was recited from the altar. These interfaith initiatives are based on the gradual elimination of the Western Christian heritage in favor of Islam. The Catholic clergy is probably disoriented by Pope Francis himself. He was the first to allow the reading of Islamic prayers and Quran readings from the Vatican. Remarks made by Pope Francis at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan have sparked a firestorm of criticism from those that do not believe that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Many have taken the Pope's remarks as a major step in the direction of a one world religion. And the truth is that the Pope has made other such statements in the past. In recent years, the theory that Christianity and Islam are just two distinct paths to God, among many others, has rapidly gained traction all over the planet. Some religious leaders have even gone so far as to try to merge Islamic and Christian practices, and the term Krislam is now often used to describe this ecumenical movement. Pope Francis also wrote in 2015, I would like to express two sentiments for my Muslim brothers and sisters. See how Pope Francis called the Muslims, my Muslim brothers and sisters. Firstly, my greetings as they celebrate the Feast of Sacrifice. I would have wished my greeting to be warmer. My sentiments of closeness, my sentiments of closeness in the face of tragedy, the tragedy that they suffered in Mecca. That is when uh, Crane fell over on the 11th of September 2015 in Mecca and killed many Muslims who were attending the Hajj in Mecca. The Pope writes, in this moment, I give assurances of my prayers. I unite myself with you all. A prayer to Almighty God, all merciful. He did not choose those words by accident. In Islam, Allah is known as the all merciful one. As we also saw Rick Warren referring to the all merciful one. If you doubt this, just do a Google search. Now, Jesus did not say, Unite yourself with unbelievers, no matter what the cause may be. That's not what he said, my brother and sister. And this is not the first time Pope Francis has used such language. For instance, the following comes from remarks that he made during his very first ecumenical meeting as Pope. I then greet and cordially thank you all, dear friends belonging to other religious traditions. First of all, the Muslims. Dear friends belonging to other religious traditions, first of all the Muslims who worship the one God, living and merciful, and call upon him in prayer, and all of you, I really appreciate your presence. In it, I see a tangible sign of the will to grow in mutual esteem and cooperation for the common good of humanity. The Catholic Church is aware of the importance of promoting friendship and respect between men and women of different religious traditions. Jesus did not say, grow in mutual esteem and cooperation for the common good of humanity with unbelievers, my brother and sister. Can you see everything that the Pope says is directly in contradiction to the word of God? My brother and sister, if you do this kind of research that I've done, and you just compare it to what the word of God says, you will see it's two to totally opposing things. And there is no way that you and I, if we are born again, Bible believing Christians, children of God can ever participate in any of these interfaith or ecumenical meetings with either any members of the Roman Catholic Church or any other faiths or religions. At number four, let us now discuss all roads lead to Rome. And first, I want you to watch this little video and see what the Pope himself says and what other people say on this little video.
La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. Oh, brother and sister, there is no way, there is no way that you can believe that the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church believes in the same Jesus Christ that you and I do after you've watched that video and seen all this material that I've given you so far. But let us now read what this author writes. Over the past number of years, I've been writing articles and producing radio programs in an attempt to urge evangelical Christians to wake up and see the light. And this is the same thing I'm doing with this video, my brother and sister, is to hopefully let some evangelical Christians wake up and see the light. Many Bible-believing Christians who were once concerned about false teaching and apostasy seem to have lost their passion for the truth and have little discernment. Instead of standing firm against unbiblical ideas and experiences, they now are promoting them. And the reason for that is because Jesus himself said, that some of the signs of the times before he comes will be, as we read in Matthew 24, verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Many people that did have a love for the true God of the Bible, their love is now waxing cold. They are falling away from the truth. Why? Because they are following after things like this. The interfaith meetings, yes, but all roads lead to Rome. Everybody is believing the same. We're all children of the same God and all that. So why spend lots of time reading your Bible? Why spend lots of time in prayer? Why spend lots of time trying to convert other people? No, you don't have to do that anymore. So their love is now waxing cold. And Jesus also warned in Luke 18 verse 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And because of things like these, people are falling away from faith, my brother and sister. This author proceeds to write, while we have been able to document that the emerging church movement is clearly another road to the Roman Catholic Church, it seems fewer professing Christians are concerned. Darkness has crept over the church the same way an avalanche sweeps down a mountain. Every day, more and more unsuspecting victims are being swept up and buried. In an attempt to sound another alarm, I'm going to present a number of statements taken from a book titled The Road to Rome, Modern Journeys to the Catholic Church. On the back cover, the following statement is made, explaining what the book is about. This collection of conversion stories relates how former Baptists Presbyterians, Salvation Army officers, Plymouth Brethren, New Age believers, and Evangelical Anglicans all made their way along the path to Rome. You see, the Roman Catholics don't get saved and become born-again Bible-believing Christians like the Protestants. No, no, no. They're pulling them all back under the auspices, under the arms of Rome. And you know, when you show these things to the people, they say, oh, but if everybody is doing it, why can't I do this? Because God said in Exodus 23, verse 2, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Thou shalt not 
That has not changed. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. So the fact that everybody is doing it does not mean that you and I should do this as well, my brother and sister. A second statement provides more information regarding the purpose for publishing the book. Quoting again from the back cover. By introducing some of the new wave converts. So these are all people converting from evangelical Protestant backgrounds to Roman Catholicism. By introducing some of the new wave converts, the path to Rome gives a glimpse of a possible future for the church. As we enter the third millennium, Catholicism, evangelicalism, and orthodoxy will continue to converge, they say. From this book, a vision emerges in which old cultural, national, and doctrinal controversies become increasingly irrelevant. My brother and sister, the word of God can never become irrelevant. Never ever. Because you must remember, the Roman Catholic Church believes that the word of the Pope is infallible. So if the word of the Pope contradicts the Bible, the people must believe the word of the Pope and not the Bible. So there is no way that you can say doctrinal contra controversies become irrelevant. Then as the age of reform draws to a close and the millennium of division gives way to a second spring, the church may once more speak with a united voice. You see, they make it sound so good. But this is not a united voice according to the word of God. This is false unity. And what does false unity cause? Let's read what happened in Genesis 11, verse 4 to 6 at the Tower of Babel. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. You see, this is false unity. This is the one voice that they had. That one voice made them rebel against God. This is exactly the same thing happening in the ecumenical movement. The one voice that the Roman Catholic Church is striving to have is their voice, with everybody else coming unto, under their auspices and their covering and following after them. That one voice is still a voice of false unity, my brother and sister. Longenecker, who is the author of that book, also accurately points out that this present ecumenical phenomenon is largely the result of a plan that originated in Rome, as I said right from the beginning, and is sanctioned by the Pope. He states, the Pope calls for all Christians. Now again, you see, saying, but we are all Christians. We are, the evangelicals are, the Protestants are. You see, the Pope calls for all Christians to a profound conversion of heart in order for ecumenism to take place. You see, you must change your hearts. We Roman Catholics, we are so open for everybody. You are the ones who need to change your hearts. He calls Catholics, Orthodox and Protestants to move forward into a new reformation of the church. In an encyclical that should be read by all Christians, the Pope calls the whole church to join in a quest for a new kind of Christianity in which all Christians can once more unite. All Christians now meaning including them who are not Christians according to the word of God. As well, the idea that a new reformation is in the process of taking place is another battle cry of emergent promoters. The reformation was a time in church history when Christianity was led out of darkness into light. This so-called new reformation is leading Christianity out of the light back into the darkness, my brother and sister. Longenecker writes, evangelicals are becoming more Catholic. In Britain, Christianity magazine, a trendy evangelical publication, ex explores Ignatian spirituality, Benedictine retreats, pilgrimages, liturgy, and Gregorian chant, which are all Roman Catholic doctrines and traditions. At the same time, evangelical leaders are less shy about asking Catholic techniques of prayer and worship. In America, 
churches where candles and said liturgy would even 10 years ago be unheard of are celebrating Lent and Advent with crosses, candles, ashes, and liturgies borrowed from Catholics and Anglicans. And my brother and sister, I also have a YouTube video on Ash Wednesday and Lent because so many denominational churches across the globe and also here in South Africa are now following after those Roman Catholic traditions. I also have a YouTube video on labyrinth prayer walking, which is also one of the traditions coming from the Roman Catholic Church, which evangelicals are now participating in. Please go and watch those videos as well if you are ready to be set free by the truth. Now, this is an interesting complex. This is the Abrahamic family house, which is an interfaith complex that was built on Sadiat Island in Abu Dhabi. It houses the St. Francis Church, which is Roman Catholic, the Imam al Tayyib Mosque, which is Muslim, and the Moses Ben Maimon Synagogue, which is Jewish, in three separate structures. And it's already built. It stands in Abu Dhabi. My brother and sister, you can go and do your own research regarding this. Now, what is this all about? The complex seeks to represent interfaith coexistence, preserves the unique character of the religions represented, and build bridges between human civilization and the Abrahamic messages. The three houses of worship, Eminence Ahmed al Tayeb Mosque, St. Francis Church, and Moses Ben Maimon Synagogue, offer the opportunity for worshippers to participate in and learn about religious services, listen to Holy Scripture, and experience sacred rituals. Everyone is invited to learn about any of the three faiths. So you can go and, you know, the Jews can now visit the Muslims and read from the Quran. The Muslims can go and visit the synagogue and read from the Torah. And the Roman Catholics can visit. And all that you can learn about these. It's all about interfaith. It's all about, you know, we all serve the same God. Stop trying to convert everybody now. You must understand we are one. And it's interesting to note. I'm subscribed to a United with Israel newsletter, and I received this one on the 18th of March, 2024, which today is exactly six days ago, where this article explained that the California synagogue decided to lease its space to the Islamic Society of West Valley. And they wrote, in this time of rising anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, the synagogue wrote, it is incumbent upon us to reach out to strengthen the bonds between religious communities in our neighborhood, recognizing there is more that unites us than divides us. As part of our interfaith outreach efforts and through the relationship previously established between our two communities, Hamakom, that's the synagogue, is opening our doors to the Islamic Society of West Valley to hold evening prayers during the month of Ramadan. And you know what happened there? They leased their premises to the Islamic society. And the first meeting that the Muslims held there, they got in a speaker speaking against Israel. You know, he was just comparing Israel to the Nazis and to Hitler and all these kind of things. So the president of that synagogue, and I think the vice president as well, had to resign because of what they allowed. Because they think, you know, we're causing this interfaith, bringing peace, mutual understanding. But in the meantime, there is no mixing. As the Bible said in the end times, you know, iron and clay do not mix. Yet that's what they're trying to do with this ecumenical movement and the interfaith meetings. But it boomerangs because it's not according to the word of God, my brother and sister. Now let us end at point five with, but the Bible says. What does the Bible say regarding these type of things? The first verse is 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 to 17 that says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If you want to go and pray with Roman Catholics, with Muslims, with Buddhists, for any common good, for any specific common goal, you are being unequally yoked together with those unbelievers. Now look at the yellow parts. For what fellowship 
has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? So many people go and participate now in the Roman Catholic Mass, the communion they have. What communion has light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, who is the devil? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, which is an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. How can you, as the temple of the living God, walk into a Muslim mosque or a Roman Catholic cathedral and think it's okay, it's acceptable? No. What agreement does your temple have with idols? Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is what the Bible says. Do not be unequally yoked to, together with unbelievers. If you have fellowship with the Roman Catholic Church, if you associate with them, your church, your denomination, your whatever, you are also having fellowship with everybody else that they are associating with. You are not coming out of them. You are not being separate the way God wants you to be separate, my brother and sister. And 2 Peter 2 verse 1, and 1 to 3 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. It's exactly what we've seen today. This whole thing regarding the ecumenical movement or the interfaith meetings, these are damnable heresies, my brother and sister, because they're pulling people away from believing in the true God of the Bible, Jesus Christ himself, and to become saved and to be converted and become children of God. They're being pulled away into a false sense of security, but we all are children of God. Oh, we all love the same God. No, we don't, my brother and sister. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and you and I do live in the latter times, my brother and sister, some shall depart from the faith. Because remember, Jesus said, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And Jesus also said, Shall I find faith upon the earth? So the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. My brother and sister, the ecumenical movement and the interfaith initiatives are doctrines of devils. Please do not be pulled into that. And if you may have been pulled into that, but we're ignorant of the things that I share with you, praise the Lord for this verse in Acts 17 verse 30 that says, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You may have been ignorant about this, my brother and sister, and the things that you participated in until this day that you've now watched this little video of mine. You may have been ignorant regarding these things that I've shown you upon this little video of mine, my brother and sister. But now, see that verse says, but now, God commands everyone everywhere to repent, to ask the Lord for his forgiveness, for your ignorance. And then he says, my child, I winked at that ignorance, but now you must repent. Repent means turn away from that. Don't be part of that anymore. Get out of it. Come out of her, my people. He says, be ye separate. Don't be like the multitude. Don't follow the multitude to do evil, God says. And in Revelation 18, verse 4 and 5, we read, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. My brother and sister, you need to take note of what God says here. This whole Antichrist system, which was initiated by the Roman Catholic Church, which is actually the Antichrist system itself, is now pulling you into this whole ecumenical interfaith thing, and God says, get out of her, come out of her that you be not partakers. You see, what is the interfaith movement? What is the ecumenical movement? Bringing together people of different religions coming together. God says, come out of her. Don't come together with them. Don't be brought together with them. Come out of them. 
and be ye separate, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. You have been warned about this, my brother and sister, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will work in your heart regarding this thing. And remember, we do not serve a dead God, because Jesus Christ said in Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And all honor and glory goes to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So let us pray together. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. We know you are the true God of the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of the people who have watched this video. I know it's a long teaching, Lord, but with you there is no time, there is no length of watching this kind of truth. And I pray that the truth will set the people free. I pray that people will get out of the interfaith meetings, that true Bible-believing Christians will get out of participating in the common good and common mutual beliefs and everything with people of other faiths or even with the Roman Catholic Church and rather start to pray for the conversion of those people to come to Christ, not to fall away from Christ, to get closer to the God of the Bible and not to the God of the world so that you can be glorified. And Lord Jesus, we know there is not much time left. We know your coming is very close at hand. So it's so necessary that we as your children will touch other people's lives to be set free from the lies of the world so that they can come to salvation in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And because we know your coming is very close at hand, we keep on crying out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Because Lord Jesus, the Bible says, the spirit and the bride say, come, for we love you, Lord. And we look forward to being with you in all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.